And the title today is $19.99. That's the title, $19.99. It's not going to take me long. It's real simple, real simple message, but you'll get it in just a moment. But let me, before I say anything, let me read you this statement that I, I, I wrote. It says this, human nature is to be comfortable with the expectations of others. Most people do not want to upset the apple cart. That's true. Most people, that's true. I, I don't mind it, but most people don't want to upset the apple cart, nor do most people want to be an electric car in a gasoline world. They just don't. They just, they want to kind of fit in. They want to, because when you, when you don't get in the middle of all that that is common, nobody wants to have the feeling of being uncommon. Because we are comfortable in that common place. But common is not what we were called to be. Common is not why, to be common is not why you were born. So let's read this morning in Isaiah 61, 1 through 9. Let me just read this to you very quickly. And then speak on it for just a little bit talk about what 1999 is the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because and then you'll see that Lord is all caps in this statement and that's because it's the tetragrammaton which is the Hebrew name of God which is Yahweh the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound sent me to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness. See, I'm going to tell you, you're not a tree of righteousness until you know how to praise in your mourning. All of these things qualify you to be trees. We're not trees of righteousness just because we've received Jesus. We're trees of righteousness because we know how to praise in our mourning. We know how to get rid of the ashes, dust ashes off until there's something else that shines through. Hmm. The planning of Yahweh that he may be glorified and they will rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations when they become trees of righteousness. They will repair the ruined cities. The desolation of many generations. He came to restore you and me so that we could restore the desolation. Say this with me. The desolate, restore the desolation of many. Oh, my. Many. Say that again. Many. 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 How many is many? A lot. a lot. Many is many. Many is whatever many is to you. Many might be three to one, but a thousand, quadrillion, zazillion to another. I just made that word up because it doesn't exist, because it isn't, we haven't found that number yet. So many. Many. Generations. Say generations. He's doing all of this so that you can be a part of the restoration of many generations. Now, I can tell you when I look around this room today, there are people here today that are affected by generations before you. You're still affected by it. It still bothers you. It still gets in your head. Sometimes you're there and you're thinking about all that's going on and you're like, oh, man, you know, this is bothering me, this is bothering me. And then you begin to think about it for a minute and you're like, oh, my Lord, how did that get there? Because this is what that generation was dealing with. Why am I dealing with what I thought I was free of that? And the Father says, well, I've come to restore. Maybe there's a little bit left. I'm telling you, he's come to restore. So that, that the, what affected the generations before you do not have to affect you. Do you believe that this morning? Don't own what was not given to you. If it wasn't accounted to you, don't own it. If it wasn't purpose for you, don't own it. Let go of it. Oh, but I can't help it because I'm reminded of this and I'm reminded of that. I was telling a man this week in the room, one of the pastors that didn't know my story, some of you in here don't know my story, you're not going to know it this morning, but he didn't know it. And I was sitting there with him at dinner and we were eating and, and he said that somebody had he said, someone told me something about you, and he asked me about it, and I said, he said, is that true? And I said, yeah, in fact, it is true. And um, he said, would you mind telling me the story? So I didn't, and I told him the story. It's not a secret. It's just I don't have time to tell it this morning. And so I, I told him the whole story. 
And I just laid it all out there. And, and he said, I, I, I can't believe it. I would have never known that about you. Hearing you tell that and looking at you, this guy has known me for 20, since 93, however many years that is. But I've never told him that story. I didn't know that I had or hadn't. I, didn't, I never saw it as an important thing to tell. And he said, I would never know that about you. You know why? Because I don't, lay, I don't own that generation. I don't own that. I don't hold on to it. I don't claim it. I don't, if I stumble or have a bad day, I'm not even going to blame that generation. I'm not even giving that generation that kind of credit. And some of y'all in here need to do that. Every time you have a bad day, stop blaming another generation. Because what you're doing by blaming that generation is just saying, you know what, I, just, I still accept that somehow I'm connected to that generation. Some point you've got to disconnect from that generation. Stop blaming that generation and just say, dog, I made a mistake. I repent. Well, that's a generational thing. I don't know. Maybe it is. I don't know. All I know is I made that mistake, not that generation. I'm the one that chose to do it today, not them. I'm the one that's choosing to walk in this today, not them. They've come and gone. If I'm walking in it today, it's my fault, not their fault. I can't blame somebody who's come and gone. Isaiah 63 or 65, I'm not sure where it is. But he says, what he did, he said, I'm going to change your name. The father told that, those folks, he said, I'm going to change your name because your name that you currently have is identified with those who come before you and nothing good was about it. But I'm going to change your name. At some point, you've got to allow him to change who you are. Believe that he has. Disconnect yourself from that generation. Stop blaming them. And I said, and I told him, I said, because I, I, I'm not connected to that generation. I, he doesn't, that, or that situation has no effect on me. No influence over me. I don't do stupid things today because of them. I do stupid things today because I did a stupid thing. It wasn't smart. If I do something, it's probably strong. I should, I'm sorry, Austin. I shouldn't have said that. If I do something silly today, I shouldn't do it. It's my fault. It's not that generation's fault. So I'm, I'm preaching to somebody this morning in here. If you're in this room this morning and you're blaming other generations, would you stop doing that? Just, just look in the mirror and say, stop. Point your finger at yourself and say, stop. Nobody came up to you and said, I'm your generational curse, and I'm telling you, you've got to do this. I'm making it plain. I'm trying to help you today. I'm trying to help you. Go ahead and get up in that mirror, and when they, when they, ah, you just say, you're the one that's doing it. You, 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 you. And you, stop. Just stop. Now I'm hot. Somebody turn your hair on. <laughs> Stop! <laughs> so you got to be careful. Let's read on. And they shall rebuild the old ruins. They shall raise up the former je- desolations. Oh, listen. There's some things that are desolate in some of y'all's lives. Some things that have been desolate because you've been trying. Man, again, a lot of things that are desolate in our lives is because we still let the previous generations own it. Disconnect! Yeah. From those generations. Disconnect from those mindsets. Disconnect from those curses. Disconnect. You've been free from it. If you've received Christ, you are free from that. Delivered from that. Stop blaming somebody else for your nonsense. And just repent of it. So that he can restore those desolate places. So that all of a sudden, fruit grows on your tree again. The grass is growing in your yard again. Does anybody hear me in this room this morning? Somebody's still struggling with it, though I feel it. I sense it in my spirit. There's people still struggling. Oh, yeah, but you don't know how hard those generations affect me, man. Every time I sit at the table, my mom and my daddy and my brother and my sister, somebody reminds me that I'm doing this and I have this mistake and I have this issue because of generations before me. At some point, you're going to have to rise up and say, stop. Shut your mouth. Shut your mouth. (laughs) Because it is not true. I am not subjecting myself to what generations before me did. I'm subjecting myself under the law of the Lord, under His Word and His anointing and His redemption, His freedom, His power, His authority to change me whole. Not in part, but in whole. He says, so He'll restore. He'll raise up the former desolations. Raise them up. You know, those ashes, those old bones, those things that you thought, man, that was promised to the generations before me, but they were so unfaithful over it, it'll never come to me again. Bull only. The father says, you know what I'm going to do? If you'll you'll disconnect from that generation, I'll raise it up again in your land. 
If it belongs to them, I will transfer that authority and I will transfer that right and I will transfer that anointing and I will transfer that promise to you. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? Somebody tell me this morning, can you believe that? All right, you got to believe that. And they will repair the ruined cities, ruined cities. And re repair those places, repair those places, repair those places. You know what? Don't listen, don't go around in your life today trying to repair things. And while you're repairing it, just say, man, I wish he wouldn't have done this. i got to fix this stupid thing. If he'd have lived a little differently, I wouldn't have to fix this wall. Instead of doing that, say, I don't like this wall. I'm just going to fix it. Stop applying that tragedy to something else. Disconnect from that generation. The desolations of many generations, strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. He free you from that nonsense. But you will be named priests of Yahweh. Priests of the Lord. But you will be named priests of the Lord. But only when that all happens, when you stop blaming everybody, we stop trying to find something to attach that to, because really the truth is, we'll get to 1999 in a minute. Back up, hold up, see you will be named priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You will eat the riches of the Gentiles. Ooh. Not just money. Not just money. Their job. Their seats in the marketplace. Their gate. And you'll own it. You'll be named to you. My, they'll call you the servants of God. You'll eat the riches of the Gentiles. Look, look what I'm eating. Where'd you get that? Off your table. Excuse me, my iPad is ringing. I don't know who that is. <laughs> if you're streaming and you just called me, shame on you. you're sitting there, you're eating, you're eating that. Where'd you get that? Uh -oh. I got it off your table. <laughs> How'd you get it off my table? He did it. He took it off your table because you weren't faithful over it. Because you complained about it. He gave you a bowl, and you thought you were going to get a jug. When he put it on my table, I said, thanks for the bowl. I'm going to be faithful over it until he brings me a jug. And in their glory, you will boast. Woo look what I got. This is good, so good. This stuff I'm walking in, it is so good. This stuff I'm eating is so good. This is what I'm wearing, it's so good. This anointing, this revelation, it's so good. How are you getting that? Because I'm not asking what you're asking. Because I'm making myself available to do what he wants me to do. You make yourself available only when you can do what you want to do. My, my, my. My, my, so good. Woo! Mm, when I get yours off your table and he puts it on mine, it's always chocolate because I love chocolate. Mm. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, those who rejected. And in their glory you will boast. In their glory. What's their glory? There's a falling away. And there's a coming too. And here's the thing about us, you know, when, when you come to the right place and you become the righteousness of God that he's talking about right here, when you become the righteousness of God, here's the cool thing about it. You glory, you boast in their glory because of this. You don't eat their, when you're eating their food and they're saying, where'd you get that? It came off your table. You don't say it because you want to be ugly. You say it because it came off of your table, but if you'll watch me, he'll, put, he'll replace yours. You don't celebrate their lack. You celebrate their opportunity. Instead of your shame, you will have double honor. Instead of confusion, they will rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they will possess double. Everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, Yahweh, love justice, and I hate robbery for burnt offering. 
Boy, I don't like it. I hate robbery for burnt offering. He said, I, I don't want you coming in here making excuses why you can't honor me with your first and your best. Don't come in here crying the blues. Hmm. He said, I will direct their work in truth, and I will make with them an everlasting covenant. That's what I like. I like everlasting covenant. I like a covenant that's everlasting. I like a covenant that doesn't come up short. I like a covenant that doesn't fail right before the clock ticks done. Hmm. Their descendants will be known among the Gentiles and their offspring among the people, and all who see them will acknowledge them that they are the posterity whom Yahweh has blessed. Man, that's powerful. So what's 1999 got to do with this? Because in the mind of society, everything that is acceptable is 1999. Society wants everything to be an even number. If it's too little, there's not enough value in it to want to own it. In other words, if you see something out there and, and, and it looks like in your mind, it looks like it should cost $50, but somebody's only charging you $3.99, some people would be, man, that's a good deal. But some people would say, I'm not buying that because it's, something's wrong with it. But if it's something that's 30 bucks and it's out there and it's, somebody's got it for 100 bucks, nobody's going to buy that. Because in the mind of society, we got this, we've got this place, whatever it is, I'm just using 1999 as a figure, but we've got this, there's a mindset within society, within the earth today, within people, anybody living today, there's this mindset of what is acceptable. What is the acceptable figure? You know, oftentimes, and as an example I'll use in this house, it's unlikely, it's rare that when people come to me and they'll say, how much was this or how much was that when we buy something for the church or we have to buy even the construction, the cost of construction. Ultimately, everyone will know in one way or another, but when one or two people or when people come up to me and they'll say, how much did you pay for that or how much did you pay for that, it's unlikely I'll ever tell them. I'll tell you why. Because in the mind of one, they'll think, that was cheap. Why would you do something so cheap? And then somebody else might come the same thing and say, you spent tithe and offering, that much tithe and offering on that? So I don't get into it. I don't give people an opportunity to get offended by how little or how much. Just say, how do you like it? It's pretty. Wonderful. <laughs> Was it expensive? Maybe to you. Depends on how you define it, because everybody defines it differently. Everybody defines 1999 differently. One person would be, I would never spend that much money. Another person would be, I would have spent way more than that because that, what you're doing, is really more important than that amount. Well, that's why I don't ask. But you say, we need this. We're going to do it. I'm using the, the church as an example. Now, for some people, that might be uncomfortable, but that's just the way, same way you, hopefully, you operate in your house. I don't tell my kids how much I spend on everything. I just get permission from my wife. <laughs> but there's never a time we're not good stewards. But see, in the mind of in, in the mind of society, there's this figure, there's this secret figure, there's this mark, there's this place where everybody's comfortable with. It's their target. And as long as everything is around that line, they're safe but because that's the common figure. Everybody's comfortable around common. Everybody's comfortable as long... If, if the majority thinks that that's a good way to do it, then why don't we do it like that? 1999 represents common, but 1999 doesn't, make you, doesn't allow you to become the righteousness of God. It doesn't disconnect you from generations who have cursed you. It doesn't allow you to eat what was on another man's table that was unfaithful over it. Now it's on yours. Because those who have that figure, whatever that mark is, that's their valid spot. That's their bargain cost. That's, their, that's where they are in all of us in this room. When you're looking for something, whether it's a car or a house or a, whatever it might be, and you look at it and you're like, okay, this is what I'm willing to spend on that. But if I lined up 10 people looking at the same thing, all 10 of those people would have a different valid cost. And, and contrary to what you might be thinking, that valid cost is not, does not reflect what the income of that home is. Because I know people who make almost nothing and they live like they make everything. And their valid cost is always high. And I know people who have a lot and their valid cost is low. And would surprise others. 
So that valid cost does not reflect the level of income or revenue in a person's home. That valid cost rec uh, reflects what is common to you and to me. It reflects what is comfortable to you or to me, whatever that might be. Because while one might be comfortable going into tremendous debt in order to achieve that valid cost, another one wouldn't even consider debt. So their valid cost decreases. Am I making sense? When we go into an issue, when we go into life, when we go into a day, Cletus, when we go into a moment, when we wake up in the morning and we're living our life and we're trying to sort out how we're going to honor the Father and what we're going to do, all of us woke up this morning. Except for one or two are still in here a year out. But, the, <laughs> but all of us woke up this morning. Wake up! <laughs> we did. And we got up. And immediately when you woke up, you begin to judge what was around you. You begin to make judgment on what do I want to wear? What do, I, do I want to eat breakfast? Don't I want to eat breakfast? Do I want to stop by the Stop and Rob and grab a cup of coffee and a banana? Do I want to eat an egg at home? Whatever it might be. And you immediately begin to make judgment on all that was around you. And you, then you, you begin to do valid uh, cost analysis. Some of you, when you got up, you, you were already talking about on your way here, where are we going to eat for lunch? Well, I want to eat at the Olive Garden. That's a little bit expensive. Well, can we go to Steak and Shake? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Should we go home? Yeah, that's even better. And I already uh, 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 totaled up my valid cost for today is to stop by Publix and get one of their salads and eat it at home with my dog and my wife and my whichever kids go home. <laughs> <laughs> My wife first, then my dog, <laughs> then my kids. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> But we got up this morning, and we immediately begin to do some valid cost analysis, and we begin to figure out our day, and what is this? What's this going to cost? What is this? What is this? What is this? At the end of the day, can I tell you this? Can I tell you this? We can't look at things like that. We need to understand that something, when you come to your valid cost, whatever that valid cost is, I'm talking about by the Spirit, and what this will add to you and what this will take away from you, that's usually where the balance is. You, you try to, that valid cost is usually where the, what you're losing and what you're gaining, where they meet. That's where your valid cost is. I'm losing money, I'm gaining food, where they meet, where you're comfortable with those meeting. That's your valid cost. Does that make sense? So when you analyze and you, you bring analysis into your day and into your morning and into your whatever it is that you're doing throughout the day, you do that every day in the natural. Well, in the spirit, you do that too. Every day. What do I mean by that? I mean it in this way, in a very practical, very practical, extremely practical, more practical than practical way. We bring valid analysis into our day every day, every time we gather spiritually and naturally. But spiritually, we do it when we do things like this. If I stay home from the fellowship of the believers that I'm joined to, at what point am I losing? What point am I gaining? And we bring that, we, we find a valid cost. And usually, if we're not careful, that will always fall on what is common. And what is common is people all around the world today are falling away from the church and falling away from the kingdom because their valid cost keeps decreasing. Because they're following what is a common valid cost instead of following after purpose and following after passion and following after the heart of the Father. And what does the Father want? Because the Father's cost is really, it's high. It's really up here. That means I don't get to stay home just because I'm tired. I don't get to stay home. I don't get to not participate just because I had a long week. But I, I put my cost up here. When I weigh how tired I am up against how significant the fellowship is, the significance of the fellowship is always greater than the loss of rest. So in the mind of many, you know, the, this 1999 figure has transcended, it has, has morphed into where we are spiritually. You know, we're always, again, in the natural, we're always looking for that valid cost. We're always, it's called a valid cost, and we're always looking for that. What is our comfort zone? When we're losing this and we're gaining this, where do they meet? That's our valid cost. What am I comfortable with? In the spirit realm, the same is true. What is our valid cost? And I can tell you this. There's a lot of people around the world today that their valid cost is on the wrong. It's, the balance is wrong. 
it's out of place. The fulcrum, where it should be, the middle point, is in the wrong place. So it's not allowing that thing to bring life to you. Instead, while we say, if, if you're hearing me today, just hear me. Just hear my heart. Hear my heart. Because really what I'm after is I'm looking for a people who are willing to rise up on the hardest day and put your head up and your shoulders back. Are willing to rise up in the most difficult moments and not look for a reason to be gone, be away, be apart, be separated, be disconnected, but are always looking for a way to plow through and be present and be counted among the brethren. Because that's what the Father's looking for. He's looking for people who are sold out for His purpose and their valid cost has nothing to do with what they're losing but has everything to do with what they're gaining. That's the difference between the spiritual and the natural. Because your natural always considers what you might lose. The Spirit should never consider what you might lose but instead what you gain. Because the Spirit always leads to life. Always leads to life. Spirit always leads to life. Say it with me. Spirit, Spirit. Always, leads Spirit. always leads to life. In the kingdom of God, it isn't about what's 1999. It is about what He desires and what He wants and what He created you and me to be and become. Yeah. It's about what He caused us to be and what He wants you and I to become. As Isaiah 61, He said, he, the, it's Christ really calling out to the Father. and He said, He has anointed me to do all of these things and it's to bring you to a place where you are the righteousness of God through me, through Jesus Christ. Not me, but through Jesus Christ. He said, my heart is to bring you to a place where you become the righteousness of God. But you do not do that if you still are dancing around, if you still have ashes all over you. He said, I want to turn those ashes into joy. I want to turn your mourning into joy. I want to turn your sorrow into singing. He said, I want to be able to do that. But I can't do that when you create a valid cost in the kingdom. He said, eliminate that. Stop considering what you're losing and stop tying yourself and blaming what other people have done generationally before you. He said, stop blaming them because what if there's any error... Hear me today. I'm saying this with as much love as I can muster. If there's any error in your life today, it's nobody's fault but yours. If there's any lack in you today, any lack, this is not condemnation. This is a message of hope. If there is any lack in you today, it's because you have laid claim to it. It's because you have received it. Your mama doesn't own it. Your daddy doesn't own it. Your granddaddy or the generations before you don't own it. You own it. If there's lack in you today, it's, be, it's not your wife's fault, your husband's fault, the person who talked about you's fault, the person who didn't give you a chance's fault. It's your fault because you've accepted that. Now, what you have to do is you have to recognize that that's not what he called you to. So you're measuring things by a valid cost by the natural and the Father says you need to stop doing that because it's not about what you lose in the kingdom, it's about what you gain. And when you come into the kingdom, it's, it's the heart of the Father to eliminate that mindset of I want everything to be a bargain. I just want it to be, I want to be comfortable with all that He wants to do in me. And the Father really doesn't care whether you or I are comfortable with what He wants to do. All He cares about is whether we do it. He really doesn't care whether you get enough sleep to show up on Sunday morning. He really doesn't care whether you want to come together and, and fellowship with other believers. He doesn't care what, how you feel about that. He cares about whether you do it. Because it's important to Him. And I can tell you today it's important to the earth. Because this earth is lacking today, Zara. This earth is lacking today. You know why it's lacking today? Because there's people all in churches all around the world today. And let me just speak of the United States. There's churches all around the United States today who are measuring whether or not they show up on Sunday morning to be accounted. They're measuring it by a valid cost that came out of the natural. And the Father says until they stop doing that, and they remove that 1999 mentality, He said, I'm never really going to be able to do anything of significance with them. Because they're teaching the next generation, which will teach the next generation, which will teach the next generation how to slowly slip away. That's really what they're showing them. It's how to blame this or that or the other or them or they or this thing, this whatever. And they're teaching them that. I never, I always wondered, you know, when I was a youth minister, I was a youth minister, I'm going to close it with this. I was a youth minister for a long time. I was in Tennessee. And I always, it used to baffle me. I mean, totally baffle me. If you do it in this house, I, right now I can't think of anybody who has. If you have, I'm, I'm just throwing this out there because I had to contend with it. But I remember when I was a youth minister, I was a youth minister for a very long time. And when I was doing that, it used to baffle me when parents would come up to me and say, well, I'm not letting Johnny come to youth anymore because I'm punishing them. Because they were late, or they were tardy for a class, or they got a C, or they did a whatever, so I'm not going to let them participate in youth anymore. I'm going to make them stay home, and this is their, this is their discipline. I'm going to discipline them, and I'm going to take away what they love. And I'm thinking, I'll say, what? 
You're going to take away the king. You couldn't take, well, they couldn't take away cell phones because there wasn't on them, but you, you couldn't take away something else. You're going to let them, they kept playing football. You kept taking them to baseball. Why don't you take away football or baseball? Which is way down here in relationship to the kingdom. And it used to baffle me. Never understood how people do that. And, and, and they, would, they would deteriorate the next generation. Because in their world, it was just a 1999 thing. It was just this comfortable thing. And they were trying to judge the spirit by the same way they judged the natural. I have to measure up what I'm gaining against what I'm losing. But in the kingdom of God, it isn't that way. You don't measure what you're gaining against what you're losing because in the kingdom, you lose nothing. You gain everything. And when you really come to that understanding, it begins to burn in you like a fire. And it begins to rage. And then the more you get it, the more it rages. And the more you begin to see it and you can see what the Father's doing, I want to tell you, He'll change everything about you, everything about what your hope and your desire what you believe for. He'll change it. Do you believe that this, this morning? Do you believe that this morning? 1999, it's not all 1999 because the Father's trying to bring you into His righteousness. He wants you and me. He wants us to be His righteousness and own things we did not think we could. He could care less whether the generation before you owned it. It's irrelevant to Him. He wants you to have things they never had. He wants you to walk in things they never did. And you are not a prisoner of their faults and their errors once you have accepted Christ and been free from it. Amen? Lift up your hands and repeat after me. Say, Father, I set myself to one, make a difference like we talked about last week and two, not to settle. Not 1999. I'm not measuring what I'm losing. I'm measuring what I'm gaining. I am. Come on, say it with me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, put your hands together this morning. I love you. I bless you. Greet one another before you go today. If you're visiting, I have a gift for you. Would you give me the opportunity and the honor to greet you this morning? If you'd come forward, please. This concludes today's message. Thank you for listening, and please join us for our weekly celebration of Christ. If you would like more information about The Rock, or to receive times and directions, please call 407-688-2445 or visit our website at www.attherock.org. God bless you and your house.